All right, we're back, and welcome back to the Atlanta Child Murders Revisited. This is video number 17, and uh, it is now 16 June. We're going to get back into this. First, we're going to start off with the uh, geography, get an idea of what we're looking at here. So I did Wayne's World where we went, we showed how in Midtown and, and Downtown, that was Wayne's kind of area that he was cruising at night and that's where a lot of those victims were found either downtown or near downtown and now we're going to expand out from that a little bit and um, kind of show you his business world where he was working he was running as working as a stringer uh, doing work for these news stations and this is another one that he, I believe he worked with. Now, this is downtown Atlanta. Here's Midtown. And then right up the road on Peachtree is WBIN 640. It's an African-American radio station. And a lot of the news that they would be getting, or some of the news that they would be getting, would be contracted out to different people and Wayne will be bringing in some of those stories. So that's that one there. There is another one right here. Actually a little closer to Midtown. And let me see here. Now this is WSB 1601 and traditionally we used to call this white columns and I'll show you why here. Um, this radio, this TV station has been there since I think the 40s or the 50s and when it was originally there, I don't know if it's there now, but they had these white columns at the front of the station from the old building let's take a look here hold on one second so there's Peachtree and this is kind of the beginning there's WSTV and let's go over here because you can see the white columns a little better. Oh, looks like they maybe have taken those out. Hold on one second. Well, there used to be white columns. Around. There used to be a house with white columns. I'm not finding it. But um, let me see. Maybe it's over here. That was kind of the traditional landmark of that area. And uh, WSB, white columns. I believe they even had as their logo there for a while. But looks like, of course... Just like typical Atlanta, they probably torn that down. It was probably older than five years. So, you know, anything past five years, Atlanta doesn't like, and it just totally obliterates it or allows it to just go to shit. And they built brand new buildings and all this kind of stuff. But WSBTV, this is the station that um, Wayne Williams was doing a lot of his work for. Um, now, of course, when he got caught, they they totally you know did just like Peter with Jesus they totally uh, you know denied him and said oh no no he didn't do much work with us he was just a stringer but the thing you got to understand about a stringer is a stringer can't get fired okay <laughs> a stringer is just a contractor that's running out there and then every day he's coming in and selling you what he has 
and then it's either yes or no. So if Singer can't get fired. He got fired, and got fired by an African American uh, uh, news agent that was working there, and she was sort of his mentor for a couple of years. And so she said she fired him. She had to fire him uh, because he was working with other stations. And uh, so that tells you right there that he was more than a stringer. If you're getting fired, that means there's some kind of contract you have just exclusively to work with them. So that's what they, that's what they're traditionally going for. Now we got WXIA channel 11, which is kind of in the same area here. Just right up the road. And um, yeah. And then we've got uh, another radio station, WGKA 920. This is like an AM news talk radio station. I don't think this station existed back in Wayne Williams' time, so we're going to put it up so you can kind of get an idea of where the news intelligentsia is in Atlanta. It's all in this north side area, and you're going to see it's going to run right up to where Wayne Williams' studio is. Okay? <laughs> And um, so that tells you something there. All right, we got Fox 5. Now, Fox used to be not owned by Rupert Murdoch, and I think it used to be something else. But, um, and then Rupert Murdoch came in and branded his Fox stations. And, you know, it used to be 20th Century Fox, but when Rupert Murdoch took it over, it kind of branded so this whole area here, going up to Buckhead, is kind of where the news people, uh, this used to be kind of the rich suburbs of Atlanta. Now I'm not quite sure what it is. Uh, let's see. And then, of course, there's Wayne Williams, uh, Nova Entertainment. I'm just putting these in so you can kind of get an idea of what, another part of Wayne Williams world okay so Wayne Williams hanging out downtown midtown then he would come in in the mornings you know he'd be cruising looking for news stories looking for whatever children whatever um, and then he would go by these news stations and try to sell what he had the next morning about eight o'clock in the morning hey this is what I got overnight and then this is her his little studio, he was probably doing some editing there, um, either audio and video. Uh, let's see, and then here is, this is where Patrick Baltazar, um, his body was dropped off. We're going to get a little closer to this so and take a, get a good idea, about right there, you see? So it's still right in his world, just a little north of it though. But let's take a little closer look at that area. I actually think that, if I remember correctly, I either went to an interview or I had a job through a temp agent there at this address. Um, yeah, hold on one second. Yeah, okay. So, so you see this... Hold on a second. So you see this road right here. This is Roxbury Road. This road comes down from, from Buckhead. There's Lennox and all that. So it's just a quick jog from Wayne Williams' house. You go up Peach Street, come down Roxbury, and then Roxbury brings you to Corporate Square. And then boom, you jump on uh, 285, and you're right down. You go right back, right back to downtown there. Now, yeah, this is North Druid Hills Road. Now I used to live right over here when I was working in Buckhead. 
I was living off La Vista, which would have been, yeah. I was living off of Bernadette Lane right there. I was renting this house or bedroom in a house. And used to go over to uh, Briarcliff, North Druid Hills. Matter of fact, over here off of Claremont, they had this great Greek Orthodox church right there. And used to go over there and uh, in October, I think, beginning of October. It was still just a little warm during the day. And they had a really good Greek vessel. That's an incredible church. I mean, I'm Jewish, but man, that church is really incredible. You go in there and it's kind of round domed at the top and there's this big, they call them icon, iconoclast or whatever, of Jesus sitting there looking at you, kind of looking down at you. It was really amazing. And then there's a, a synagogue over here I used to go to in Druid, uh, Druid Hills. There's a lot, big Orthodox community. I'm not Orthodox, but You'd see him out there on Saturday walking back and forth up and down La Vista Road, Druid Hills Road to the synagogue because, you know, you're not allowed to drive. But um, anyway, let's take a look at corporate. Now, if I remember correctly, yeah. About right here. So here's a creek. I believe it's either Nancy Creek or Peachtree Creek. And right back in the back here, it, it's been all been re, redone and everything. But right along close to the creek, about right here, I believe, was where Patrick Balthazar's body was left. This is an open parking lot. So Wayne Williams just drives down from Buckhead dumps the body over here at night and then he gets back on 285 or 85 and goes home. Now this let's take a look here oh this is interesting hold on one second let's see how close this is Oh, okay, that one's way over there. Kind of out of the way. That's This one should be east. Let me put this one at east. Hold on one second. Because we're going to come across that one again. 13. Hold on one second. All right, so here we go. So we got Patrick Balthazar, age 11. Remember, he was living over there just to the west of what is now the Mercedes uh, football stadium. And then he was on his way to the store, I believe. Or was that? Yeah, I believe he was on his way to the store. Last place he was saw is 201 Cortland Street. And then his body was dropped right there off of Corporate Square. And that was right around February 6, 1981. That's about a week or two after uh, President Bush, or excuse me, President Reagan officially announced that the FBI was getting involved officially in solving the, uh, the murders. Now, they had been advising. They had been providing uh, support, crime lab support, things like that, but this is when the FBI fully engaged. That means the FBI was sending out agents into the street to question people, to follow up on evidence, to man the bridges, stuff like that. So that's that was the difference. And then how they got rewarded by Wayne Williams for that is that he stole Patizar, uh, Patrick Balthazar off of Cortland, killed him, probably at his studio there up in Buckhead and then dumped his body right here off of corporate. And again, like I said, there's the FBI office just one one exit away. So he got as close as he could without getting caught and then he dumped the body there. So let's take a look at the FBI headquarters and see what we can see there. 
Hold on one second. See, there's an FBI headquarters right downtown, right down from where Nathaniel Cater was living. But again, you're not going to want to, I'm sure there were cameras back then just like there are now. You don't want to be dumping a body in the middle of downtown because somebody somewhere is going to see you do it. Okay? All right. So let's see. Yeah, see, there's Claremont. Hold on a second. See, there's there's corporate. He's dumping right here by the creek. Okay, if you follow this creek up, this is North Fork of Peachtree Creek. This is going to take you right by the FBI office. You see? So he's sending a message that, again, like I was saying about the dodgeball, he's sending them a message. I'm dumping in the river. Now I'm dumping in a, in a river or creek right next to your office. Fuck you, FBI. This is what he's saying. This is a, a game he's playing. You'll see him start to play this game. He, he gets really cocky, and, of course, he does the same thing when they report that there was a body, uh, some guy got caught, arrested, said he dumped a body of Sigmund Road, and they didn't find it. And then what did he do? He goes out there and dumps a body on Sigmund Road after it was reported in the, news, in the newspaper. So he's playing games here, dodgeball games with the FBI. You know, it, again, if you, if you got the FBI personally involved in investigating the crime, you've hit the big time. You don't get any bigger than the FBI in uh, United States crime. And again, the reason why the FBI never got involved before because murdering, especially murdering a child, is a local crime handled by the local police. There's constitutional limits on what the federal agencies and the state agencies are allowed to do. And so unless, you know, unless somebody took a body out of Atlanta, drove over to Alabama, drove up to Tennessee, drove over to South Carolina or down to Florida and dumped the body down there, the FBI would have absolutely no jurisdiction. But they made a special case to get the FBI involved. And because the Atlanta police, they were having all kinds of problems and uh, weren't able to solve it. But basically... That's a big fuck you. He dumps the body specifically off of North Fork of Peachtree Creek, right down one exit from the FBI offices to get their attention. Okay? And this is exactly what the FBI had predicted. They would, he would do something like this. They said that when a month later, when they had the big fundraiser at the Omni, they were expecting Wayne Williams to dump a body right outside the doorstep. But, of course, again, it's downtown. Wayne Williams is not stupid. There's hundreds of people and cameras running around, so he's not stupid. But he did the next best thing. He dumped a body right next to the FBI office. And there it is right there. I think that's it. Hold on. Let me double-check the address. 2635. 2635. Yeah, you can't get any closer than that. I mean, he could have drove up, up here and dumped it in the bushes right by the parking lot. He could have dumped it here, but I'm sure there are cameras, even back then, all over the place. All right. Okay, so I've gone over my time. Let me just check out this last address here. Um, this was another FBI... I think this is the newer FBI uh, headquarters. You know, because what happens is agencies, they get busy, they get busier, they need more agents, they need more bigger facilities. All right, let's take a look here. I don't know if this, I don't think this one existed back in 1980 but there's another office right here off of Mercer Road this used to be Mercer University 
And so what happened when Mercer University closed down, their whole campus got taken over and sold and chopped up and different companies and agencies took over their properties. But let's take a look at the FBI headquarters here. Yeah, you see, they're, they're brand new construction. Yeah, that's a brand new office right there. I guess that's the FBI. Hold on a second. 3,000. I'm not sure about that one. Hold on a second. You always want to double check what you're looking at. Yeah, see so they have the Mercer campus right there, but they sold off a lot of properties off this Mercer Road or Flowers Road. Yeah, the FBI should be right there. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, you can tell. You see they got all this fencing up just in case some terrorist decides to ram a truck through there. And actually, I think I used to work... I worked so many temp jobs, I get, I'd get, i call and they'd send me here, they'd send me there when I got out of the military. And I think I actually worked in this building right there just for a couple of like, weeks. All right, so we're going to move on and uh, pick it up. Hold on. All right, so we're continuing with the Wikipedia article. It says, fibers from a... A carpet in the Williams residence were found to match those observed on two of the victims. Now, when you say kind of a blanket statement like that, it didn't sound as conclusive. So, they're not talking just colors here. Larry Peterson had a electron microscope. That means he can basically zoom in to almost the atomic level. Okay, and so this fiber that's in this carpet was a tri-lobe fiber and when it's triangular like that that gives it the chance to catch and it makes it more durable okay and that type of fiber uh, for that carpet was only put in 82 rooms in homes in all of Georgia okay and so when you have four or five rooms with that same carpet in one house plus the German Shepherd dog hair, plus the yellow acetate from the blanket that was found in the house, that was, and the fibers were found on victims, and then the geolocation of where Wayne Williams is located compared to where all the bodies are being spread out. When you get all of those combinations together, the uh, and then. I went over the fact that he was caught on the bridge dropping something into the river and then he lies on the lie detector test three times and he fails. The probability, especially in an, a seasoned FBI agent's mind and also the fact that he matched over 20 of the 21 psychological profile of who they said the killer would probably be, it was a slam dunk for the FBI. Okay, Now, being that the fiber evidence was a new science, the DA wasn't so sure that the average Joe, like you and me, on a jury, could comprehend it. But even they got it. See, that's why they dropped it down to two cases. Because if they had tried to try all 30, it would have become confusing and probably would have ended in a hung jury. Not, a, not an acquittal, but at least a hung jury. So... They, got, they took their two best shots, and they went with them, okay? And I can understand it. It's just, but now, 40 years later, we're dealing with the aftermath of that. So, the reasoning was kind of like this, okay? Say you wanted to assassinate someone, and you're the military, or you wanted to take out a target, okay? Say you wanted to take out a dam. Say you wanted to take out a nuclear facility. Something. Now, you could go all 
Chinese, Korean, Japanese wave and send in a whole division of guys into a territory and fight their way to the target and kill and destroy a lot of, you know, break a lot of things and kill a lot of people and eventually get to the target and blow it up. Or you can send in, your, you know, a crack team of your best five guys to infiltrate, get in there, and take it out. And this is what they did. Instead of taking on all 30, they took their two best and sent them in and busted them like that. Because like the FBI guy said on the monster, he says, you can only serve one life sentence. 30 life sentences is just the same. Or one life sentence is just the same as 30 life sentences. So this is what they did, what, why, why they did what they did. Anyway, we'll keep going. Let's see here. It says... Uh, Furthermore, witness Robert Henry claimed to have seen Williams holding hands and walking with Nathaniel Cater on the night Cater is believed to have died. Now, you remember I, we went downtown and I showed you that Rialto Theater? That is where Robert Henry saw him. Now, I wish I, I could get a hold of his statement, um, police statement. I'm going to try, and we can find out what time. He saw him, okay, because it's going to have to be somewhere after 9 or so, between 9 and 2 uh, on the, the night of the 22nd because Wayne Williams says he got up about 9 or, excuse me, 9.30. He left that appointment in uh, the music studio, whatever, in East Point, dropped off those photographs, then he said he went home, and then he went downtown to the San Suchi Lounge, and then he went over to Smyrna and got caught. So it's going to be somewhere between 9.30 and 2 in the morning because he got caught about 2.50 or so. It says, on June 21st, Wayne Williams was arrested. A grand jury indicted him for the first-degree murder and the deaths of Nathaniel Keeter and Jimmy Ray Payne, age 22. The trial date was set for early 1982. And again, you got a grand jury. I went over... What a grand jury is looking at, you know, I think I did that, what, two days ago? And so you got about 20, 24 people that are looking at all the evidence. They're asking questions. They're bringing in witnesses. And then they look at it and say, yeah, there's enough evidence there that we think that he did it. And so we're going to charge him. And see, this is the great, you, you have no idea how a great thing a grand jury is. Okay, so it's the average Joe, the average guy, a plumber, a grandma, a teacher, a pilot, a doctor, all the way from the least educated janitor all the way up to a Harvard professor can be drafted into a grand jury, okay? Because if you're registered to vote, you can be pulled into that jury pool, okay? It's a great. It's one of the greatest things in about American democracy that you. I never appreciated it till I keep getting older and older, and you see that places like South America and Asia, the government just comes and arrests you, the police, and their DA, and they just throw you in jail and say you're guilty. Okay, and then you have to prove and spend your money that you don't have because you're not working because you're in jail to prove your innocence, okay? In America, the great thing about America is that you're innocent until proven guilty. They have to allow you rid of habeas corpus. That means release of the body. They have to allow you to put up a bail, okay? Unless you're like some serial killer like Wayne Williams. Um, but some kind of reasonable bail to fit the crime, and then, you know, they have this great thing about a grand, you know, jury of your peers. And that includes a grand jury. So what could happen if we didn't have that in because of court cases and legislation, you could just have a DA file charges with no grand jury and then still have a jury of your peers, uh, your peer of four. But we've got another added thing about our great democracy is that we've added another insight that we're not just going to allow some elected official 
to say, oh yeah, you're guilty, so stay in jail until we take you to court, and then you'll have your day in court. You have to have a grand jury. The the DA, this is why it's so laughable when Trump says, oh, it's the weaponized um, Department of Justice, it's the weaponized Biden administration that's coming after me. Well, that may be true. I doubt it. But in this case, and this is this is why Trump should really, really appre- appreciate our Constitution and American democracy, because it's not just up to the president, President Biden, his political rival. It's not just up to his appointee that was approved by Republican Congress, Merrick Garland. Okay, it's not just up to his special prosecutor that. Merrick Garland appointed and did and I've been reading in great detail about all this all these things about how they investigated Trump and they tried to get Trump to return the documents and he re- completely played a game with them refused even got him caught on tape doing it so they have to take the DA John Smith or whatever his name is the special prosecutor has to take this before a group of Trump's peers down in Miami, anywhere from the janitor all the way up to big multi-million real estate moguls can be in that jury pool, okay? Just your common man, they have to look at the evidence, and they, they looked at the evidence, and it was clear to them that 37 times Trump broke the law. 37 times. It's not like Biden's saying, oh, we're going to, it's a witch hunt. We're going to go get this bastard because he went after my son. Now I'm going to get him. No. I got a jury of just common folks that looked at it and said, hey, yeah, it, uh, from the evidence, and they, and it's not like they're force fed here from the DA here. This is what it is. This is what it is. This is what it is. Believe it or not. They got to ask questions. They even got to subpoena their own witnesses. It's the greatest thing one of the greatest things about our democracy, okay, is the grand jury. And then they looked at it, and 37 times they said, yeah, it looks like Trump broke the law. Because this here's the law, this is what it says, and this is what he did. Yeah, it looks like he broke the law. And then they charged him 37 times. So the same thing here with, with w- Wayne Williams. It's not like the government decided oh it's a bunch of clans members it's a bunch of racists but we got to cover it up okay because if this all gets out this going to be you know race riots and all kinds of crap you had a grand jury of Wayne Williams peers looked at the evidence and they said yeah yeah let's charge him because it looks like he did commit a crime and then He went to trial, and he had another jury of his peers that said, yeah, he violated the law. He killed these people, according to the evidence that we've seen. And they convicted him. And it wasn't, you know, the mayor or the police pushing it down people's throats and hiding evidence and going after Wayne Williams. And then, on top of that, he appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court of of Georgia and they looked at it and they agreed. No, his civil rights weren't violated. He got due press process of law. And we agree with the, the jury's um, decision because the evidence looks like that, that he did kill these people. So don't let anybody today, 40 years later, try to confuse you and say, hey, Wayne Williams didn't kill all those people. See, now the confusion is comes because they only tried him for two out of the 30 but we're I'm, we're going to slowly get into it here where I show you that the same evidence they convicted him on for the two is the same fiber evidence that they can that they wrote off the other 28 murders it's almost exactly the same now there may have been other people involved helping Wayne Williams there may even have been in one or two cases, like maybe with the girls, somebody completely different. 
but we're going to go into that and slowly, like I said, if you can't take the slow burn, you can't take the step by step, here's this, here's that, and then this links up with this from a month ago or two months ago, then don't watch my videos. Go, go watch a TikTok video. If your attention span is only about 30 seconds, this video is not for you. It's going to be painful. It's going to be boring. Please don't. I don't want you in pain. Go, go play your video games in your mom's basement and watch your porn and, and you know, do something else. Because this is serious stuff. Serious evidence and allegations for serious adults. We don't have time for children's games here, okay? So go do something else. Anyway, it says when the news of Wayne Williams' arrest was officially released, his status as a suspect had previously been leaked to the media. FBI agent John Douglas stated that it was Williams. Then he was looking pretty good for a good percentage of the killings. Douglas had previously conducted an interview with People Magazine about profiling the killer as a young black man. This was widely reported that the FBI effectively declared Williams guilty and Douglas was officially censored by the director of the FBI. So this tells you how serious the FBI takes the Constitution and presumption of innocence in the law that they would censor their own profiler who got it right okay for mentioning in the media before Wayne Williams got even got a chance to have a trial that yeah it looks pretty good he's fitting most of the points from my profile of who the killer should be that they would officially censor even though he was completely 100 percent right that the FBI takes the rights of the accused so serious that they don't allow anyone to make any statements of presumption of, of guilt because there's the presumption of innocence. That's why you're not hearing the FBI say that, yeah, yeah, all the evidence looks like Trump's guilty and he's going to go to prison for a long time. Now, you may have media people saying that. You may have ex-law enforcement, ex-district federal attorneys, whatever, saying stuff like that. But no official person in the FBI or even... The Department of Justice, uh, if, I don't know if you've noticed, has said these things. That Trump's absolutely 100% guilty. Okay? Because we would hope that if the day ever came that somebody in the FBI got accused of a crime, that the people would consider them innocent until the state can prove them guilty. This is not Mexico. This is not South America where they throw your ass in jail and then you have to appeal and try to prove you're innocent. This is America. It's another great thing that we can celebrate that with all our faults, with all our horrible history, that we do have some little shiny diamonds that we can look at. And you'll hear me complain a lot about America and law enforcement, but we do have our moments and that's the thing with everything in life. Nothing's perfect. If you're looking for something perfect, you're never going to find it. If you're looking for some perfect mate or girlfriend or boyfriend, you're never going to find it. You're going to have people that are brilliant and smart and kind and wonderful, and they're going to have their faults. Everybody has faults. That's part of being, part of the human experience is having faults and accepting people's faults. Okay? And even witnesses have faults. Even accused people have faults, but doesn't mean that they're murderers. Okay? Just because Wayne Williams failed at a few things that he had tried in his first five years of being an adult doesn't make him a serial killer. The evidence makes him a serial killer. Okay? Anyway, I went past my time here. All right, hold on a second. 
and we're going to go on. All right, so here's a UPI news article from the archives on January 9th, 1982. Of the trial, they haven't convicted him yet, but we'll see what the news story says. It says, FBI agent says Wayne Williams lied. Two FBI agents testified. Now you notice how there's no one officially from the FBI coming out giving a news conference saying Wayne Williams just lied. No, this is testimony that they can't get away from. They're being brought in as witnesses, so therefore they have to tell the truth at the trial. All right. So it says two FBI agents testified that accused Wayne Williams lied and gave different stories to them in questioning in the morning he was stopped driving off a river bridge a minute after a stakeout cop heard a loud splash. The second week of Williams' trial for the murder of the two, 20, two of the 28 young blacks slain in Atlanta concluded Friday after testimony from one policeman and two FBI agents who talked with him on May 22, 1981. Superior Court Judge Clarence Cooper told the jury at the end of the day that the trial was much further along than any of us had anticipated and enjoined until Monday. Sources indicated that the judge felt the celebrant trial may be over in five to six weeks. And he was about right there. Williams is charged with the murder of Jimmy Ray Payne, 21, and Nathaniel Cater, 27, whose body surfaced downstream from a bridge two days after Williams was stopped there. Again, another pretty damning piece of evidence there. The state claims Williams, suspect in at least 10 more of the killings, threw the bodies of Payne and Carter off the bridge into the Chattahoochee. The prosecution has also taken its case as far as May 22nd incident when Williams came first came to police attention driving slowly off the bridge after a stakeout officer below heard a loud splash. When police and FBI agents stopped his white station wagon a mile and a half from the bridge, they testified he cooperated fully. He allowed them to search his car and they found on the floor of the back seat a 24 inch long piece of nylon rope which the officers did not confiscate. Now remember I said that back then unless you got a warrant I mean they could they could have confiscated the evidence and tried to use it in trial but back then because there hadn't been any cases that had gone to the Supreme Court about this a judge probably would have thrown it out because the defense could claim hey they didn't have a, a, a warrant to search the car even though they had Wayne Williams permission they still didn't have a warrant so this is why the FBI, which goes by the book, okay, they go by the book, they're probably calling people, their lawyers in uh, headquarters in Atlanta, and even at the Department of Justice, we've got this 24-inch long piece of rope and other evidence inside the car. Should we confiscate it or not? Should we arrest him or not? And they're saying no, because right now we don't have a search warrant. Carter, whose body did not appear until May 24th, had been strangled. Craig Gillen, a young, handsome, and stony-faced agent, said he saw two cardboard boxes in the compartment area in the rear of the station wagon. He said Williams told him he had gotten one of the boxes at a liquor store by the bridge and another at a convenience store nearby. But agent Mike McComas, who questioned Williams at length that morning, said the 23-year-old Black photographer told him he got one of the boxes at a service station. It says witnesses witnesses who watch the car come off the bridge, make a U-turn at the liquor store, and go back over the bridge say it never stopped for boxes or to make a telephone call, which Gillen testified Williams said he made. Gillen said Williams told him he was vice president of a firm called Nova Entertainment. Now you remember... Nova Entertainment's right up there in Buckhead. McComas testified Williams told him he owned it. Gilliland said Williams said um, said Williams first said he wanted the boxes to move music equipment. Later he said he had books at his mother's house that he wanted to move them. 
I asked him why he stopped at the bridge. William said um, he said he didn't. I asked why he had driven across the bridge so slowly. He said he wasn't driving slowly. I asked him uh, what he threw off the bridge. He said he didn't throw anything from the bridge. He claimed there was a two pure litter vans or trucks on the bridge at the same time he was. Gillian said, but the agent and all the other witnesses have testified that William's car was the only one to cross the bridge over a period of at least a half an hour. Gillian said when Williams was stopped, initially he was nervous. He appeared somewhat excited. After a few minutes he calmed down and had a very quiet manner. When Williams got out of the car, Gillian said his first words were, what's this all about? Gillian identified himself as an FBI agent. He said, Williams said, oh, I know, this is all about those boys, isn't it? You see? And let me give you a piece of advice. Don't ever, ever, ever lie to the FBI. That's a federal crime. Don't ever, ever, ever lie to a policeman, but it's not as serious as a crime. But if you lie to the FBI and they can prove it, they'll definitely use that. And then they'll threaten prosecution on that in order to get you to cooperate. So don't ever, ever, ever lie to the FBI because it's basically going to be your word with the jury against the FBI. This is why the FBI tries to have such a squeaky clean reputation. Because when they go into that jury that courtroom, and you get an FBI agent on the stand telling it in front of the jury that Wayne Williams said this, Wayne Williams said that, they, that's gold. They're going to take, the jury's going to take that to the bank and run with it. That's like, you might as well have it, it dictated or recorded on a film. Because when an FBI agent says it, it's gold, Okay. This is why the FBI is very careful about what they say and they're not going to stretch things and they're not going to make up shit. Because once burnt, people are always going to be remembering that. Okay? All right. So let's see. Okay, so that is the end of that article. Now let's go into our last part, which is the video. All right, we're going to pick this back up and just keep driving forward. 15 kids are dead. Two others are officially missing and listed as part By early February 1981, more than a dozen young African-American boys had been found dead. Many dumped in the woods around Atlanta. I was very fearful. This is Patrick My Baltazar's God. mother. Sheila Baltazar pleaded to send Patrick back home to the rest of his family in rural Louisiana. If I had somewhere to send my son, I would have sent my son. One evening, a white man in a big car appeared to threaten Pat Now, you remember Patrick Baltazar was picked up off of Cortland, which is like east downtown Atlanta, and then he was dumped right there off of Corporate, right down the road from Wayne Williams' studio, and also right down the road from the FBI office. Patrick and a small friend. The little boy said that Patrick said, man, that might be the killer. Patrick used a payphone to call police. He told them, a man was chasing me and my friend in a brown Cadillac. Well, actually, they thought it was a crank phone call. They didn't send a car out. This is a sketch the other boy provided to police after Patrick was dead. Two weeks later, on February 6th, Patrick stopped by the restaurant where his father worked to ask for money, then walked back toward the Omni. He never made it home that night. I'm like, he didn't come home? Oh. Now remember, we looked at Foundry, which is right behind the stadium there. All those buildings have been completely destroyed or knocked down, but that's where he was going back to. Again, he's passing right through that um, Omni area. So that's, again, Wayne Williams' hunting ground right there. That's his world. Oh, my God. 
That was the first thing popped in my head. Missing. Murdered. Oh my God. The Atlanta Missing Persons Bureau continued their hunt for this missing child. 11 year old. One day it seemed like it was a week. That was the longest search in the world. It was almost 2 p.m. when maintenance man Ishmael Strickland found the lifeless figure. You see, so they got him. Wayne Williams drives up to the parking lot, dumps him here by the creek, the creek side. Figure of a young black boy lying in some bushes. On the seventh day, a maintenance man spotted a body tossed down into the woods behind a parking lot at a suburban office complex. The bank was fairly steep. Medical examiner Joseph Burton had to hold on to a rope to get down to the scene. He had a ligature mark on his neck, like if somebody had a ligature and they were behind you or off to the side behind you. What he's saying is he's talking about a rope or cord and they come up behind you and they strangle you like that. And they close their hands or fists together and pull the ligature basically. In other words, killed from behind. Most likely, yes. All right, let me place another sample on this side. State crime lab scientist Larry Peterson attended the autopsy. I can recall at one autopsy pulling a fiber off of one of the victims. It was a green carpet fiber and mounted the sample on the slide. Went over there you go. the microscope and went, it's the same one. You knew same right away. right then. And it became apparent that the body was indeed another victim of Atlanta's child killer or killer. Again, the only problem I'm having with this, okay, is I'm having two problems. Three, actually three problems. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Hold on one second. So I'm just thinking logistically why I'm having a problem with this. So this is Wayne Williams' world here. Cortland is about right here where his dad's house was at or work was at. Foundry's over here. So about right in here in the middle of downtown is where he would have picked up Patrick Paltazar. Okay. Then he would have got back on the highway, gone all the way back out here to where he lived, right there. Killed Patrick Baltazar in his house without his parents seeing, without Wayne Williams' parents seeing him at all. Killed him on that carpet. Patrick Baltazar picks up carpet fibers on his body. Then he wraps him in that yellow acetate blanket puts him in the trunk gets back on the highway drives all the way back up to here and dumps him off that's the only problem I have with that if there's a green carpet fiber there he's logistically having to go back every so what we're gonna see as we're doing uh, this Excel sheet is everybody, like I said, that has a green carpet fiber is basically killed at Wayne Williams' house without his parents seeing or without anyone seeing him loading a body into the back of the car. That, to me, you'd think statistically someone would see something. But then again, if you think about it, if you see, he kills half of them at his house. That's 15. And we'll say that's over 22 months. Okay. So, 22 months times 365 days. That's 669 days divided by 15. So, about every month and a half he's killing some kid at his house putting him in the trunk of his car now you know I guess most neighbors are not going to be sitting there watching through their window your driveway for 45 days so that is reasonable I guess you could say in some some way but still it's just 
I don't know. Crazy. Anyway, we'll keep going. Killers. Again, Local television carried these pictures live from the crime scene. As it was studied, it became apparent it was one of the three children listed as missing. We're told that the child's body again had not... Sheila Baltazar got a call from her mother. She say, um, they found another body. She say, um, I really feel like this is Patrick's body here. You know. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> 30 years later, folks. Oh but if he is one of the three missing children, the chances are strong that he was 11-year-old Patrick Baltazar, who disappeared one week Mrs. Baltazar and her husband went to the funeral home to identify their child. Wow. They told me he had struggled, you know, for his life. And seeing the print, the you know, the rope print across his neck, all the way around the front. At Patrick Baltazar's funeral, she would insist on an open casket. I just wanted the world to see that this child could have been anybody's child. That's right. Patrick's fifth grade classmates wrote a poem, read at his funeral. This from local TV coverage that day. Patrick Balthazar, our schoolmate, you came to school, though sometimes late, but you were never mean to anyone. You tried to help people and thought it was fun. Then one night, one terrible night, you didn't come home not even at daylight. Something's happened to that boy, the people said. Patrick is missing. Is Patrick dead? So, Patrick Baltazar was about two years younger than me. I'm 57 now. If Patrick Baltazar had made his way home that night and Wayne Williams had not been cruising in his world, Patrick Baltazar would have been 54, 55 years old now. And would probably have children... And, and grandchildren of his own. But Wayne Williams decided to kill him for his own selfish, evil reasons. And 29 other children that didn't make it that all would have been we would all be about the same age give or take for a few years and there would be you know little Patrick Baltazar juniors and little Patrick Baltazar grandchildren and maybe even grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren running around today. If not for the actions of one crazy man, Wayne Williams, and maybe some others, but the majority of the blame lies with Wayne Williams. And it's a disservice to Patrick Balthazar And to the other 29 victims, the same way Williams is innocent because of people's ignorance.
All right. Well, we're going to close here, and we'll pick it up tomorrow. We'll just keep driving on. All right. Take care.